We're in the book of Ephesians. We're just getting started. And um, we've looked at verses 1 through 6, which has given us an introduction into this wonderful salvation that we possess if we have come by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a salvation that was planned by the Father in eternity past. It is a salvation that was executed and made possible by the atoning death and resurrection of his son. And it is a salvation that is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit who has come to permanently indwell us. This is a salvation that is from and because of our great Trinitarian God. And because of this uh, great salvation, we've been brought into spiritual union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because we've been brought into spiritual union with him, we have been granted every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. That is, in all of God's realm, we have everything that he has in the way of blessings because we have the blessings that he has granted to his son. And why would he do that? Why would he do that? Well, not because of us. I mean, not because we're something. Not because we have any merit. Not because we have any righteousness. Not because we have potential. Not because of anything in us. Only because of his good pleasure and for his glory. <clears throat> and we saw that while we have these blessings and we have them all, we don't lack anything, <clears throat> we do not fully experience those blessings while we're here on this earth, except as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God. It is as we are under the control of the Spirit of God while we still live here in the flesh awaiting glory, but it's in that state that we experience the love of God and the peace of God and the patience of God and the joy of God and the gentleness and peace of God and the power of God and the direction of God and the wisdom of God and every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. So, it is our desire to live this life not in the flesh but in the spirit as he controls us and we can only do that as we intake his truth so we know what we are called to do and we yield our wills uh, to him. And now we're coming to verse 7. And I don't think we're going to get past verse 7, so don't get discouraged. Let's see, one verse at a time, one week... <laughs> So Paul continues to tell us uh, about the blessedness that we have in this great salvation. You know, we've talked uh, before about the number of words in the New Testament used to describe the reality of this saved state. Um, those who are saved are said to be sanctified, that is, set apart to God holy in the righteousness that he grants, justified, that is made right under the law, um, elect, that is sovereignly chosen, um, born again, that is spiritually alive, and there are others, but we have two here in, in verse uh, 7 that are kind of linked together and are exceedingly profound, so we want to spend a, at least one session talking about them. And that, those are the words redeemed and forgiven. So let's look at verse 7. It says, in him, and again we say it over and over again because the scripture does, everything that we possess, everything we have, every blessing that God has granted to us is only because we are in this union with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And it is in him that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So what is redemption? Well, redemption is a word that speaks to purchasing and setting free. It's an interesting word and provides a very powerful explanation to the people reading this letter because at the time of its writing, you had Rome in control of the world and Rome was a society that was undergirded by slavery. Some estimate there are as many as six million people enslaved in the Roman Empire. Now slavery in that empire meant a lot of different things. In some sense you could literally put yourself in slavery as a worker to pay off a debt or as a worker because you had a better chance of survival working for someone and giving your entire life to them than you did out trying to work as a day laborer and feed yourself. But there are other forms of slavery in Rome that we'd be very familiar with and they were debauched and they were evil and people were uh, mistreated horribly in that institution and there was no escape from it. The only escape from it was you either died or you were purchased out. In other words, you could or someone could buy your freedom. And that's, that's the picture of this word that describes our salvation. The, the picture is that we are slaves to our sin and we are in bondage to it. And we have been in bondage to it from birth. It is the result of the fall. It is from Adam and Eve's rebellion that every person born into the world has entered into this world in a state of spiritual slavery to their sin. Someone would ask the question, well, doesn't man have a free will? I mean, we got into this in some depth when we looked at the sovereignty of God in the book of Romans. And the question is, but does, God have, is, does man have a free will or is he just a puppet? Is he just a robot? Is he, is he just, is he just a, um, a play toy for God? No, he has a free will. The Bible's clear about that. Uh, but he doesn't have a free will. So the answer to the question is yes and no. What do I mean? Well, God, man's will is free in the sense that there is nothing that forces him to choose against what he desires or she desires. No one forces a person to make the choices in life. There isn't some cosmic power. There isn't some karma. There isn't some reason that you're making the choices that you are other than you make the choice. So you're free to do that in that sense. All men and women are. However, you're not free to choose God. You're not free to choose righteousness. Why? Because you're evil. Because your nature is given over to sin. So, given your free will choice, you will always choose sin, which is what you love. Man loves his sin. Now, when I say you, I'm speaking of you before you came to Christ. Because that's what this word means. It means that Jesus has purchased you. You being a slave to your own sin and your will being in the bondage to it could only choose against God and choose for sin and evil. Manifest, by the way, in many different ways. It doesn't mean that you were the worst of the licentious, lawless sinners. Uh, you could have been the most religious person on your block. I mean, you could be the Pope. You, you could be, you can be anybody. 
apart from Jesus Christ, your sin manifests itself in all kinds of ways, including self-righteousness and abject evil and every place in between. But you are nevertheless in bondage. And Christ has come to redeem you, purchase you. Turn with me to 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. And verse 18, he says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the traditions from your men, but with the precious, by your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you weren't, you weren't redeemed with the valuable things of this world because there's nothing in this world that is valuable enough to buy a soul. Nothing. There's only one thing that's valuable enough to purchase your soul and set you free from the bondage of the sin that enslaves you. And that's Jesus. That's his blood. In him we have redemption through his blood. Now again, I, I, I want to repeat what we say a lot of times. Now this is not the fluid that ran through his veins. This is a, a metaphorical word. This is a word that speaks of death. Um, Pilate said, this man's blood is not on my hands. He wasn't talking about his physical blood. He was talking about the death that he was going to sentence him to. And similarly, when the Jewish people cried out, let his blood be on us. He isn't talking about his, the fluid in his veins. It's talking about the death that he, they are bringing about by their actions. So it is Jesus' death that atones. It is his death that sets us free. So the price that he's willing to pay is he's willing to give his life the most precious of all things. The most precious of all things. Have you ever thought about what it takes to be the Redeemer? It's fascinating because in the Old Testament we have a picture of it in Boaz and Ruth. It, it's that story of the kinsman redeemer. In the Old Testament, in order to be a kinsman redeemer, you had to be related to the one in need who needed to be purchased or needed to be cared for, needed to be brought in. You needed to be related, you needed to be able to pay, and you needed to be willing to pay. All of which Boaz was willing to do. And isn't that a ma magnificent picture of our redeemer? Because we're related to him because we're in union with him, because of God's grace, because of this great salvation, we have been brought in union with him. We are now in the family of God. He has purchased us and purchased us into his family. He was willing to pay, willing to go to the cross, and he was able to pay. It was by his death and his death alone that that price could be, could be paid. So Christ is that perfect reality of the picture of the kinsman redeemer. But in order for redemption to be um, efficacious, there's some qualifications for the redeemed. You see, the redeemed have to understand they need to be redeemed. <laughs> they have to understand that they are sinners. They have to be under, understand that they're in 
bondage to sin, that they are helpless and hopeless to do anything except sin. And then they have to be willing to come by faith, repenting of their sins and giving their life over to the Redeemer. And most people are not. Most people are not. One of the places it's most evident uh, today is in some of the liberal churches. Churches that at one point in time had the gospel, had an understanding of the substitutionary atoning work of Christ that redeems. But over the years, they've moved away from it. They may still talk about Jesus, they do. May have Jesus on their signs. You know, may talk about the fact they read the Bible, uh, claim the Trinity, say they're about Jesus' work. But if you've lost the need for a Redeemer, you've lost the gospel and the salvation that he offers. Because in liberal churches all around the Western world, they have changed the gospel to one that says, we don't need to be redeemed, we just need to follow Jesus as our example. We just need to be good people doing the things that he did. And that's going to be good enough. And so the church, in many cases, liberal churches, they've turned into social action groups. People that love to do good works and stand for good causes. And all of that's, in a sense, good. But they have no redeemer. And they are not redeemed. And what's the result of this redemption? Back to Ephesians for a minute, in verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. I hope everyone in this room has been redeemed. And I hope everyone in this room understands the amazing gift and freedom of having your sins forgiven. Which sins? All of them. All you've committed in the past, all you're committing in the present, and all you will ever commit, all forgiven. And not only forgiven, but you're set free from its guilt. Because you're no longer in bondage. That's why in Romans chapter 6, we've been there a lot, but let's go there again. First in Romans chapter 8, the Lord says what? There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are what? In Christ. Because in Christ you are saved. Because in Christ you are redeemed. Because in Christ you are forgiven. Because he is your redeemer. He is your redeemer. And in Romans chapter 6, he says uh, in verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its loss. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. 
you're set free. The will that was in bondage is set free. And you now, for the first time, have an ability to present yourself to righteousness, to present yourself to God in service to Him, in love of Him, in praise of Him. If you're caught up in sin, you're there because you put yourself there. You're there because you want to be there. I know that's a hard thing to say. But I'm here to tell you that if you're redeemed, you've been set free from the bondage of sin and you are free to make the right choices about your life. You still have to do it. That's why you have to be operating under the Spirit of God. You have to be operating under the control of the Spirit of God. But you are forgiven and you are set free and why? Well, according to the riches of His grace. Because of the riches of His grace. Because of His unmerited favor to you. That's where all this salvation ends up. It's all because of His unmerited favor to undeserving sinners. And how rich is His grace? Well, we've just begun. We're not out of verse 7 yet. <laughs> this whole first chapters of Ephesians is all about the riches of His grace. And then he says an interesting thing. He says, according to. He doesn't say out of. In other words, when God lavishes you with His grace, He doesn't have less grace afterwards. Because He gives you all His grace, it doesn't mean uh, the people next door are going to lack getting any. It is according to. It is, it is all of the wealth of His grace is available to you in its totality in Christ in this great salvation that Paul is working us through. You are rich. You are rich in everything that is important, everything that is eternal because of Him. You know, there's a, there's a beautiful Old Testament uh, picture of this reality. It, uh, it occurred on the Day of Atonement. Uh, Yom Kippur, one of the feasts of the nation of Israel, celebrated every year. In that, um, in that ceremony, the priest would take two um, goats that were unblemished, spotless, and one of them he w they would uh, sacrifice and kill and, and take the blood to the altar. And the other one, the, the priest would put his hand on, ceremonially transferring the sins of the people to that goat. And then they would take that goat out into the wilderness where it would never find its way back. Isn't that what this verse is? That's just, that's just symbolic. That's just a picture of exactly this verse. Verse 7. It is Christ who paid by His blood, by His death. He is the one that atoned. He atoned. And because he atoned, your sins are forgiven. They are what? They are put as far as the east is from the west, away from you. Your sins are gone because they're paid for. East and west, they don't meet. Isn't, aren't, you, aren't you so thankful he didn't say north to south? <laughs> but that's the picture. And verse 7 is the reality. It is, um, it is an amazing truth. This salvation that we have been granted by his grace for his glory, not because we deserve it, just because of his good pleasure and his love for us. 
all of our sins are forgiven. There is no judgment. There is no condemnation. But you can't exit this discussion without at least mentioning this. And that is, we still sin. Have you noticed that? If you haven't, you have a problem. We still sin. And while we are forgiven, there is no longer any condemnation. While we are fully righteous because we possess the righteousness of Christ, we still live here in the flesh, in this world, until we get to glory. And so we have a battle with sin, and so we need to deal with it the way the Lord calls us to. And that is, we need to acknowledge it, confess it, and turn from it when we see it. That's what confession means, by the way. Confession just means to say the same thing. It means to say the same thing about your sin that God says. That is, acknowledge it and hate it. Turn from it. It's not, it's not in the sense of condemnation if you don't do this. It is forgiveness in the sense of a father forgiving their child. The Lord gave us a picture of it in the upper room when he, when he told Peter, uh, Peter, you don't need a bath. You've already been washed. You just need to get your feet washed. In other words, your righteousness is settled, but you walk in this world and you're going to pick up dirt and you've got to deal with that. So, we come to him with our sin, acknowledging our sin, saying the same thing about it, not trying to hide from it, rationalize it, justify it, excuse it, blame somebody for it, but we acknowledge it, hate it, turn from it, and trust that the Lord will restore us and move us forward. Because you see, if you allow sin to take root in your life, you will stop the work of the Spirit of God in your life. You will not be in that place where God can bless you the way he desires to bless you. You will stop the spiritual growth that he has desires you to grow in and you will not have the testimony that he wants you to have. You will circumvent all of the blessings that he has poured out on you because you won't be able to experience them because the Spirit of God will be grieved and quenched in your life. So you need to make sure that sin is dealt with on a current basis as well. Let's pray. We're, we're going we're gonna to stop here. Father, thank you for our time and thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this great salvation. Jesus, thank you so much that you atoned for us, that we could be redeemed, purchased from the bondage of sin, purchased from such a cruel taskmaster as sin. It is who we were, Lord, but you have set us free. So now we desire to present ourselves to you, Lord, present ourselves to you for the work that you have for us and to experience all the blessedness that you desire us to have and know. We can only do it as your spirit leads, guides us, and fills us. Help us to do that, Father. Help us to do that so that we can honor and glorify you with the days that you grant us here. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.